Welcome in. We do welcome everyone to another edition of the Sacramento State Stingers Up Football Podcast. And we have made it here to the season finale, the Causeway Classic. Oh, I'm so excited. So glad you're with us. I'm Jason Ross. And uh, thank you, first of all, for joining us on the podcast. For those of you that have downloaded the podcast and check it out and make it a part of your weekly prep to get ready for Hornet football. Um, I'm so excited. I, I can't even begin to tell you as someone that, you know, my own background that went to UC Davis, that worked broadcast games for them, but for the last, since 1997, I'm all in. I'm a Hornet and have worked for the Hornet program and know all the coaches and families and everybody like that. It's just you're so connected to this program now. And I had dreamt about a day where Sacramento State and UC Davis once would be in the same conference. So that's happened again, obviously, when Davis moved into the big sky. And two, that we'd have a situation where these two teams could be playing a Causeway Classic that meant something at the end of the year. And I remember it's probably been a decade or so now that they put the game to the final game of the year. So that is a bonus. They're in the same conference. That's a bonus. They're both going to the playoffs. That's amazing. And this game, for the third consecutive time that this game is being played, Someone, one of the two teams, is playing for the Big Sky Championship. That's amazing. Davis was in 2018 and in Reno and won, by the way, the last Hornet road game loss in the Big Sky. In 2019, the Hornets were playing for a share of the title as well, and they beat Davis, and they won the Big Sky Conference. And this weekend, the Hornets are playing for it again, and they'll either have sole possession or playing for a share. They'll know, by the way, because Montana, Montana State kickoff before the Causeway Classic. So amazing. And uh, before we get into a look back of last week's impressive win over Portland State, we also have to kind of get you updated on what is going on with Sacramento State football in the Big Sky Conference. And I think the great news to report, there are five teams that are going to be playing in the playoffs. You've got the Brawl of the Wild with Montana and Montana State playing this weekend with both teams fighting for seeding and better positioning in the bracket. Eastern Washington, based off their win last year and their season schedule, they play Portland State. A win or a loss, they're in. And then Sacramento State and UC Davis, they're both in. And the irony of this, when I was really looking at it, because when you you read about this, there's rankings. Like Davis is ranked 10th. The Hornets are ranked 11th in one poll. People are getting caught up in that. But there's going to be a committee after Saturday's games are done that's going to pick the field of 24. And the five teams I mentioned, Montana State, Eastern Montana, Sac State, and UC Davis, they're all going to be in. But it's going to depend on what you've done. And what they're going to look at is your good wins, your losses. Are they bad? Are they damaging? Um, How have you done against other playoff teams? So if you look at, let's just take UC Davis and Sacramento State, for example, on kind of a resume test. For the Aggies, where they will brag about and should brag about and get a lot of extra credit for is their win over Tulsa. Also a win over Weber. Now, Weber has backed out and is not going to make the postseason, but that's still a couple of nice wins, a loss to Eastern. I don't really think there's shame in that. The one outlier that was weird, it's a hard one to explain, is what happened to UC Davis against Idaho State. So all that being said, 8-2 and two right now. A loss gets them in. A win gives them another quality win, beating a ranked Sacramento State team, and that probably will improve their standing. For the Hornets, you look at their 8-2 and two, and your two losses, Northern Iowa ranked at the time. We all know, watching it or being there, six turnovers, a brutal third quarter. They deserve to lose. But that was if there's such a thing as a quality loss. Now, Northern Iowa's dropped back, but at the time they were a ranked team. And then losing to Cal, they were 25, 26-point underdogs. And I didn't feel like they were going to win the game, but played with them and, and did okay there. Their quality wins, of course, against Montana, and then if they beat UC Davis, that's another one in the resume, and also playing so well now, winners of seven consecutive games. The strange part, though, is the two teams that do not currently, of those five, have a FBS win because Eastern beat UNLV, UC Davis beat Tulsa, Montana beat Washington. They're all with two losses in league, and they can't win the league title. They can't get an automatic bid but they need the help of those FBS wins, and they got them, and that's great. They deserve that, whereas the two teams competing for the top spot at 7-0, and Montana State and Sacramento State, do not have an FBS win. Montana State's only loss is to Wyoming. They've won nine in a row, and the Hornets, as we said, loss was to Cal, 
and to northern Iowa. So it's great to see the conference, which is highly regarded. It's going to get five teams in. It's going to be another Sunday where you have to watch the selection show to see where the Hornets are going and where the rest of the conference is going. And if we try to do any comparisons to past years, when you look at how the FCS playoff bracket looked, let's go to the last time the Hornets made it, and that was 2019. And the playoff bracket that year, again, rankings, what we all get caught up in, but seeding is what's more important. The Hornets came in with a bye, and they were the four seed. The three seed that year was Weber State. They had a bye. The five seed that year, Montana State. They had a bye. And the six seed that year, Montana, they had a bye. The top eight teams will have a bye and host in week two. The next 16 teams all will play in the following Saturday, right after Thanksgiving, with the eight of those highest 16 at home. And so if we're looking at what's at stake for this week, I think there's a decent chance that the loser still could get seeded, but I would say probably not. So the loser between UC Davis and Sacramento State, I think is going to be hosting a game next Saturday. That's my gut. That's what I believe. I don't know that to be true until the seedings all play out. What could help the Hornets in that department is if Montana State really took it to Montana, because then you could argue a Montana loss, a Sacramento State loss, they both would have an 8-3 and three record. What would be more impressive, Montana's win over Washington or the Hornets' win over Montana? So that would have to be weighed when you're looking at those two teams. I think Montana State is all but a lock for a seeded game. I do think Eastern Washington will beat Portland State, so that gets them a pretty good chance to be a seeded team with a bye. Um, But the whole thing is we're going to watch it. There's going to be more football, and both these teams, UC Davis and Sacramento State, are in a position where they're playing in a Cosby Classic that means a ton, that they want to win, but they don't have to. And that's you don't have to play it that way. The players won't. The coaches won't. You know that Saturday's not the last day of football for these two teams. And that's, that's a good feeling to have because it, it takes, as a fan, myself, takes the stress off the game but doesn't change the desire to win. And that's what's going to be great and keep this thing going, see if the Hornets can get to eight in a row and um, nine and two and improve their standing and get a best chance to play many more weeks of football. So the Hornets set that up though, that whole possibility because of what they did last week. And let's take a listen back to a really uh, game, a game. I have to admit, I was nervous about with players that were out before the game or heard uh, we heard might not play coaching staff warned me a little bit like, Hey, this is a legitimately very good football team in Portland state. And for a while, it was a little bit shaky for a while. And then the Hornets started to dominate. Cognetti, Clark, and Sinkowski has been so effective. Or he became the school season season, a single season record with 15 made field goals, making one last week. Left hash, 30-yard field goal. Clark to hold. Cognetti the snapper. Snap comes in, ball placed down, the kick on the way, and he got it. Oh, sweet 16. Beautiful. Nice drive, three points, 11-24 to go first quarter. 16 field goals. And that's 12 in a row. A record, 12 in a row. And Portland State changing the play one more time, down to two, down to one. They get the snap just in time on fourth and seven. And Alexander rolls to his right. He's just going to heave it downfield into traffic, and it is caught. And intercepted, I believe, by the Hornets. It is intercepted by Sacramento State. Sanders with the pickoff. There was the receiver and Sanders there, and I didn't know who had it at first. (laughs) Dominic Sanders for the Hornets ends up getting the pick, and you're right. That was a bomb. A blitz was coming under duress. Long pass down the field, and I don't know. Sanders was there turning around, and then the receiver came back and tried to catch it around him, and when they went to the ground, Sanders had the better positioning and more control of the football. And after the penalty, this will be about a 31-yard attempt between the hash marks. Again, Clark, the holder, Cognetti, the snapper. Ball placed down, the kick on the way, and he's got it. All right, so 6-0. But on this drive, the Hornets thought they had a pick six of 100 yards. But it was taken back by a penalty as they had an illegal substitution. Didn't get off the field in time. Second and goal. Davis Alexander signals to his right. He's going to look that way. He's going to throw a fade to the back of the end zone. It's caught. Did they bring it in? And no ruling. Touchdown. What a catch by Chase. Whoa, that was close. 
Dorian Chase got his foot in on that sideline right before it went out at the side of the end zone for a touchdown to tie the game at six. Well, Danny's there. Danny, any good uh, good view on that? You think it's a catch? Yeah, he got his, his right foot in on the catch, and he completed the play all the way through. Well, good throw and catch, and if this extra point is good, this will be the first time the Hornets have trailed since September. Incredible. So the snap comes in, the kick is on the way, and the kick is good. So Sacramento State trails for the first time in a long time. 7.04 to go in the first half. Portland State 7, the Hornet 6. We'll get short. The Hornets will return it for a rare time. It's Gandy. Gandy's got a seam here to the near side. He's scooting up to 30, to the 35-40 with blockers. Got the kicker to beat. He could go. 30, 20, 10, 5. That didn't take long. Right back in the lead for the Hornets. Devin Gandy takes it the distance for the score. On first and 10 at the 29-yard line. Alexander back to throw pressure up the middle. He throws over the middle, and it was intercepted intercepted again. again. This time it is Mapu, and he's scooting up the sideline. He could go. Mapu has nobody but his teammates running with him. Touchdown, Hornets! And here we go. Hornets first and 10 at their 38. How aggressive will they be? It's going to be a play-action fake. Stepping up in the pocket is Dunaway. Looks big ball downfield. It's Gandy. He's caught it at the 10, at the 5. Tackled at the 3-yard line. First and goal, Hornets. And the Hornets didn't have any timeouts left, and they go big ball. 18 seconds left in the half. Dunaway will shift Scadaboo. He goes in motion. Back to throw. It's a dump off to Scadaboo. He caught it. Touchdown! Touchdown, Sacramento State. They get the touchdown they wanted, and they get it on the board. They lead now 20-7. to Oh, my. All's well that ends well. The controversial fumble, the interception, the interception for a touchdown, and then the bomb that gets you in position for the touchdown. Man, that was the hardest, <laughs> <laughs> the hardest earned score you'll ever have. First down and goal at the eight. Scadaboo is in the backfield with Asher O'Hara trying to get Martin in motion. He does. O'Hara will keep it. He'll dump off. There's Martin on the move to the five. Nice stiff arm, and he scoots into the end zone. Touchdown, Sacramento State. Really good work by the offense here to start the second half. This is feeling like a week ago. It was a close game. Remember, Cal Poly? It yep. was close. It was 14-9, and then the Hornets turned on the, the Jets. Yeah, if you're joining us late, the Hornets gave up the lead for the first time in 276 minutes and 24 seconds. And that lasted for 14 seconds. They trailed 7-6, took the next kick back for a score, got a score right before the half, and now they get one here in the second half. 27-7, extra point is up, extra point is good. Handoff up the middle to Scadaboo. Scadaboo to the 20, stays on his feet. Now he's going to stiff arm a guy and gets into the end zone. A touchdown from 38 yards out. Hornets go up 34-7. The keeper by O'Hara. O'Hara up the middle. Oh, he went right over the guy. He just hurdled him and lands into the end zone for a touchdown. The Viking defensive back came right across his midsection. He went right over the top of him and landed into the end zone for a touchdown. Oh, Gable slips through. Gable's to the 20. Gable's to the 10. He's to the 5. He's in. Touchdown. Sacramento State, a 33-yard touchdown run for the freshman, Elijah Gable. Squirting through. (laughs) Here I'm reading all the substitutes on the chart, and the Gable family is on their feet. Sacramento State has won seven consecutive games. They've set themselves up to try to win the conference next week and try to go undefeated if they can beat their rival, UC Davis. Your final, Sacramento State 49, Portland State 20. Guys down here with the head coach as the fireworks are going off in the background, Coach good game today for the team to come out it was kind of a shocking rocky first half but they came through yeah i mean a very strange first half i think we had two pick sixes for touchdowns or was yeah they didn't neither of them neither of them counted and you know but we um the the kickoff return was huge for a touchdown um that kind of got the whole thing going in our way and then uh and in the half with the touchdown that was big so you know we didn't play our cleanest first half but our guys are resilient. I mean, they're tough. They're going to compete. They're going to make plays. We just got to play a little bit cleaner, but really proud of this win. This team had a lot of players missing, and you guys always say the next player 
player up. And these guys who came in and filled out today did a great job. Yeah, it's that time of year. Hopefully we'll get some of those guys back next week. But, yeah, I mean, you got to – somebody's going to feel sorry for you when you got guys out. And our, we expect – we have high expectations for all of our backups to come in and play, um, you know, well when they have the opportunity. And they, and they did that tonight. Have to be great to get some of your freshman players in in this fourth quarter. Elijah Gable in for a touchdown, but it's great to get these guys reps this time of year. Yeah, I mean, these guys work. Uh, our scout team and our backup players, you know, they don't always get an opportunity to play, and they work really hard, and they're a, an important part of our success. So it's nice to reward them with an opportunity, and then also nice to send our amazing senior class out with the, with the victory. It was great for those guys tonight, and, you know, we don't like to look for it, but, you know, next week, Causeway, we want people to come out for this big game next week. Absolutely. It's, uh, we'll enjoy this one tonight by playing a, a really well-coached, very good football team on, on Saturday, and uh, we'll be ready to go. Congratulations on the win, Coach. Thank you. Singers up. All right, so that's a listen back to last week's win, another one seven in a row over Portland State. Now let's lock in. Let's talk about the Aggies. UC Davis, 5-2 and two in conference, 8-2 and two overall. Like we said, this is a, a good football team. They've had to play multiple quarterbacks. If you try to go to... A common opponents, well, both teams have played Dixie State. Hornets beat them close early. Uh, UC Davis routed them 60-27. to 27. Uh, UC Davis and Sacramento State both played Idaho State at in Pocatello. Hornets got through that one. Remember, that was a little bit wobbly for the Hornets, and I still maintain kind of a swing game for the season. That was the weird weekend in October where the Aggies lost by 10, and it actually felt worse. Uh, Northern Colorado, both teams played. The Hornets had struggles with that, but they won. Davis won relatively easily. Uh, UC Davis played a closer game with Cal Poly. The Hornets had relatively zero trouble with Cal Poly. And then the other game that UC Davis was trailing at times with Northern Arizona, but won on the road. That's a good win. Uh, The Hornets dominated Northern Arizona. But they'll settle it Saturday. It'll happen on Saturday. We'll get a better idea of who uh, the better team is, at least on this day. Uh, coming up on Saturday, November 20th. But let's get more perspective on UC Davis, the guy who calls their games. Uh, Scott Marsh has done this for a long time, and he's taken a a very close look at this team. We'll be on the call again this weekend, so we get a chance to catch up with Scott Marsh. Well, it's it's the biggest causeway I think we've ever witnessed, and someone who could, uh, I would say, validate that is the voice of UC Davis Aggies football, a former Aggie. Scott Marsh, you have... Been to games, you've covered games on the sideline, in the press box. Have you? Is there a bigger causeway than this one this week? Jason, first of all, it's great to talk to you. You and I have shared many a causeway together. You know, our stories are so tied with the causeway, and I think you're right. I don't think there is one that's bigger than this year's. And what I love, and you and I have talked about this before, when uh, Davis uh, was entering the big sky, we would say, could you imagine – Could you just imagine if there was ever a time where Sac State and UC Davis were either playing to get in or to win a conference title? Well, now all of a sudden, these two programs are really, really good consistently now, which is fun. And not only does this game have big meaning, there's a safety net. Scott, both teams are still going to go to the playoffs. I think this is pretty fantastic. The season will not end on Saturday. No question. There are two things I wanted to see before I retired from sports broadcasting. (laughs) One of them is going to happen this year. It'll be the Aggies and the Hornets in the playoffs in the same year. Now, of course, the other one is Kings and Warriors, and we're still waiting for that one. And it could possibly happen this year, maybe. But, uh, yeah, though this is awfully exciting. And I guess, you know, UC Davis isn't officially in the playoffs. If they lose to Sacramento State, there'll be some nervous people watching the ESPN broadcast for the FCS seedings on Sunday morning. But I really feel like they're in regardless. Yeah, I'm with you. And no doubt that you, you, you know, Sacramento State's in for sure. I, I would think both are based on the seasons they've both had, based on where they're ranked now. Davis at 10, Sac State at 11. Uh, reputation, which before wasn't there. But, Scott, when you win league in 2018 like the Aggies and 2019 like the Hornets and then keep backing it up with good seasons, these schools finally are getting a well-deserved reputation. Agreed. And I'm not sure if the balance of power is moving from Montana to California in the big sky, but it certainly is evening out, you know, because obviously Montana State and Montana are are, are really good this year. They're going to be in the playoffs most likely. Eastern Washington is still a powerhouse. But now when you start talking about the best teams in the big sky, Sacramento State, UC Davis are obviously in that conversation. And what's great, too, I mean, I think it's just a matter of time for Bo Baldwin and Cal Poly and maybe make that trio yeah. of schools just to, I mean, didn't happen this year, but you know they're going to be good soon. 
No question. He's an outstanding coach. He's won a national championship already at Eastern Washington. He's coached at the highest level over at Cal. So, and Cal Poly is a terrific school. So there's no doubt in my mind the Mustangs with that revamped offense are going to be a threat in the future. All right, Scott, let's talk about the Aggies. Eight and two, great season. Got it started with just a perfect note to go out and win at Tulsa. Um, but, but consistently, really good all year. There's a couple of weird outliers, the Idaho State game, but played well even last week in the loss to Eastern Washington. What makes the Aggies good? Why, in your mind, are they 8-2? and two? You know, they've been opportunistic. The defense has been bend, don't break. They give up a lot of yards. But in the red zone, if you look at the numbers, they don't give up a lot of touchdowns. And then they force a lot of turnovers. You know, they've had 13 interceptions on the year. They've had four late game uh, changing turnovers that have, help the Aggies win. So the, the defense has really helped out a ton. And then offensively, Yolanzo Gilliam is still one of the best backs in all of FCS football. He's been really huge for them. Creative offense. They've, they've used three different quarterbacks. Trent Tompkins has just been a total playmaker and uh, special teams has been good. Daniel Whelan's an all American punter. Lan Larison returned one for a touchdown last week on a kickoff return. Isaiah Thomas is one of the best returners in all of the nation. So just a really solid, fundamental, well-coached football team. When the season got started, people thought the Aggies would be good, and they've backed that up. I, following you guys, I thought the game that really propelled you and really caught my attention was the win at Weber. That was hard fought. It could have gone either way. You had Both teams had some quarterback issues in the game, yeah. but you won that game. What, what did that game do? I know it was a long time ago, but it, to me that felt like from afar that was a really big win. Statement win, you know, when we went to Montana and won in 2018, and of course Sacramento State doing it this year, those are marquee signature wins. UC Davis had never won at Weber State before, so to win there on the road in Ogden against what was a really good team. Now they've fallen off a little bit. They're not going to be in the playoffs this year, but at that time, a ranked team, it just felt like another marquee signature win, the program elevating. It was kind of a blessing and a curse, though, Jay, because they got the win. Miles Hastings came in in the fourth quarter in relief of Hunter Rodriguez, who suffered a concussion. They got the game-winning drive scored with under a minute to go to win the game. But the unfortunate part of that, Hunter Rodriguez, since that point, he, he's come back, he's healthy to play, but he really hasn't been the same quarterback. And now Miles Hastings is starting at QB, and that, that's kind of been a little bit of, the, of an issue with the Aggies. They really haven't played as well since that signature win against Weber State. Yeah, you know, we, you know it, and we all talk on this podcast about the Hornets playing two quarterbacks this far into the year, and they do every week. You guys have played three, but it's not a really a rotation. So how no. has the three worked with, as you mentioned, Hunter Rodriguez, Miles Hastings, and Thompson? How has that all worked? Well, you know, Hunter and Miles have been the starters, and those two have just rotated. Hunter started the year, and he was fantastic and, and was the quarterback, number one, no doubt. But then, as I just said, he suffered that concussion against Weber State. He wasn't able to play the following week. Miles Hastings started. He wasn't all that effective. Trent Tompkins came in in relief. They scored two touchdowns and won the game. Fast forward to Idaho State. Hunter started back again through two quick first-half interceptions. Miles came in in relief of him. And then kind of it's been Miles' starter after that. The one thing you can know for sure is that Trent Tompkins, a.k.a. Magic, is going to play a quarterback at some point during the game. He's going to run the football. He's going to make plays. And so that's kind of been the rotation for the Aggies. I don't know if there's a team or a style that's bothered the Aggies. I mean, the Aggies have won so many games, and most of them, honestly, have been by a score or more with the exception of the two losses. What I don't know if there's a weakness, but what, what maybe has bothered Davis so far this year? You know, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if there's one any glaring thing that the Aggies have a weakness on. I think of late, they've had some injuries on the offensive line, and they haven't been able to run the ball as well. The protection hasn't been quite as good. So pressure up front uh, might be an area of concern, although the Aggies should be fully healthy at the line again, and they've got an experienced group across the front five. So um, I don't know if there's anything there. And I, I guess maybe on the defensive end, two bigger backs with bulk. And, and in your case, with uh, Cameron Scadaboo, who's a kind of a, a bowling ball. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the type of back that's given the Aggies some problems. I mean, you look back at the Idaho State loss, that was the case with Tevin Davis. And, and then, of course, Eastern Washington's got a couple of big backs with Tameric Pierce, who came back. Um, so that, that could be a source of concern also. How much of the second half did you really see last week? <laughs> well, you know, beginning of the second half, it was all clear. And when Landlerus had returned the opening kickoff for the second half, it felt great. 
But then slowly, it kind of felt like we were in San Francisco and we were overlooking the Golden Gate Bridge because the fog just rolled in and it just got thicker and thicker. And then it was just impossible to see from the booth. And it was, it was really fun because, you know, I was doing the ESPN Plus broadcast and things started going viral. They were showing some footage on Sports Center, and you could see all the tweets across the country. You got to check out this game. It was late night in the big sky in the fog. Um, it was just a total fog bowl. I'd never experienced anything like that. And I think for people listening, it might be the closest thing to people who watched the Chicago Philadelphia playoff game in the fog at Shoulder, Soldier Stadium, Soldier Field. Um, it was that level of fog. I mean, you really just couldn't see a thing. I mean, what did you do? I mean, I, I don't want to say you were making things up, but were you trying your yeah. best to, if you kind of saw where the ball was? I mean, how did you do it? Oh no, we were making things up, Jay. You know, it was it was like just getting Aggies. things off the teletype. You know, it's like a Ronald Reagan back in the day when he would be broadcasting from, I guess, Iowa, or whatever, mm-hmm. and getting on a teletype. Things three minutes later, and you just had to make up what's going on. No, it wasn't quite that bad. And fortunately, since the game was you know being televised, there were cameras, and so the, the camera lighting was better than what the stadium lighting was. Mm-hmm. So I found myself watching the monitor more than I was actually watching the game live. And from that, I could see better. But, you know, things that went on across the field, there was a fourth and three that was a pass to the far side of the field. And I didn't know if it was complete, incomplete. The only way I could really determine when I saw the defense running off the field, I figured uh, the Aggies must have turned it over (laughs) on downs. And, of course, as you know, like watching field goals, almost at any time, you don't know for sure based on our vantage point. We're looking at it from a sideways view, not from back of it. But in in the case of this game, it was just a total... Let's just guess and see what the the official says here. And in, in fact, at one point in the game, it was thirty seven twenty, and then all of a sudden the scoreboard switched to thirty eight twenty. And we were trying to figure out because I saw the official signal extra point no good, but I I, I think they couldn't even see the extra wow. point, and they got overruled some point because <laughs> there was a mystery point put on the board at some point that nobody could figure out. But of course, it didn't matter since the game was out of hand already. One point for fog. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We were watching. Steve and I were watching from our booth. We had the game on your your uh, TV cast and on ESPN yeah. Plus. And it w- I mean, some of the times I went, honestly, how can they? As we saw fog coming into Hornet Stadium, but it was nowhere yeah. near as bad. I thought, oh man, it's probably coming here. I, I couldn't believe how you guys did it. Some of the images we saw, just I could, I just saw heads and shadows. That's it. <laughs> you know, we just rolled with the fog basically and <laughs> just did the best we could. And unfortunately, the fourth quarter because it was twenty four twenty going into the fourth quarter. And then, you know, the fog didn't bother Eric Berrier because he threw for two fourth quarter touchdowns. And, and Davis going into that game had outscored opponents 96 to 13 in mm. fourth quarters. So obviously the fog took away the Aggie mojo. And uh, it was interesting because you guys kicked off an hour later than us. So yeah. I, you know, we got into the car. I tuned you guys in on the radio, and I was thinking, boy, you're absolutely going to see less than nothing. Huh. But fortunately, the view was better on your side of the causeway. So Yeah, a little bit better. Certainly a lot better, I would say, because it wasn't nearly as bad. Um, yeah. it, for you, Scott, how does – I mean, 2018, anytime that happens for the first time, I know that was such a magical year yeah. for Davis and the program and winning the conference and winning a playoff game and advancing a couple rounds. Yeah. Um, how does 2018 and this year parallel? Or how, are they same, different? What, what's the uh, feeling like? Yeah, you know, to some extent, it's kind of a more been there, done that this year and just more business like, you know, and to your point, the first time you do it, you always have that sense of euphoria and it's kind of like you've proven something and now it's kind of expected. And I would say that's probably the same thing for Sacramento State, too, with 2019 and what you did versus this year, where it's just kind of like we know we belong and this is this is nothing surprising to us. Um, The one thing I would say from the outside, you know, just kind of from a broadcaster's perspective, and this isn't necessarily coaches or players, but I felt like that 2018 team had something really special to Mm -hmm. it because it had an All-American quarterback uh, with Jake Mayer, who's now playing in the CFL, and Keelan Doss, of course, who broke every school record at wide receiver, just got picked up by the Jets. They had two extremely special, special, elite, top FCS players this team doesn't quite have that. It's got a great back in Alonzo Gilliam. That team seemed to be getting momentum as the, the season was going on. This team, in my mind, feels like the momentum is slipping away a little bit. Like, I don't feel like this team's playing as well in November as it was in September. Mm. Yeah, it's funny what you say that about not even expectations, but been there, done that. I, I go back to week one for the Hornets, and we didn't know what this season was going to entail with you know yeah. program being off last year. Yeah. 
and sure. they went to Dixie State, and I thought the Hornets would win, and they won, 19-7. I just thought they were okay, but I remember going home going, man, I just, uh, and I'm thinking, I'm kind of going, eh, on a 12-point road win. Where have I, why am I getting yeah. spoiled by, and it's only one yeah. year that the Hornets did it, but I kind of remember thinking, well, I don't know. I, I wasn't that impressed with this game. Because there was times, Scott, I know for Davis, but more so for Sac State, where I think we had three or four years where any time we went on a plane, that team wasn't winning. Yeah, exactly. It was just like air ball one traveling <laughs> in the big sky. So yes. I know that feeling very well. Um, you know, it's just interesting because, it, it, again, the season started so well for UC Davis. Yeah. And, and um, I think in part because we played in the spring. We had mm. those five games that – it kind of catapulted us and uh, we caught a Tulsa team who had some injuries and all those things caught them at the right time, got that win. I think it really helped. But right now I feel in a way it may be hurting the team. You know, just the senses is that you can just tell players and coaches it almost, it feels like they've been playing for two years straight. Interesting. Um, and, and it's hard to get the momentum feel right now because this week normally would have all the hype of the Causeway luncheon and a press conference with both coaches and players there. And you'd get a really, strong emotional vibe and you'd see everybody we don't have that this year so i'm not feeling the same sense of pre-level excitement we know the game is the most meaningful one in terms of playoff implications and a possible big sky championship for the hornets but i'm not feeling that pre-game buzz that i'd love to feel and normally are accustomed to and i think it's because you know with the pandemic still going on we're not able to and then for sac state conversely i feel like you guys started off a little bit slower because you didn't play, you know, in the spring. And, you know, your Dixie State game wasn't overwhelmingly impressive. Um, I know you played well at Cal and, and, and lost there, and there's there's no shame in, in losing to Cal, uh, except they did lose to Arizona, yeah. but, you know, having said that. But, you know, I feel like you guys are building momentum, and I feel like you're really playing your best football of the year right now. Yeah, I think that's what they would say, too, which is encouraging. And, you know, hopefully that leads to – to longer runs for both teams. My, my secret goal for this, Scott, we had, we'd already got to this dream of having this game have this kind of impact, but I also had the secret wish that they play one more time, and that would mean round two, yeah. round three. Who knows when that would be? I think it would be great if we had, uh, I think it was 88 where they played in the regular yeah. season and in the playoffs. If we had a, a return to 1988 with this team, all, these teams in the postseason as well would be great. It'd be great for Hornet fans because they won both those games in 1988. So I'm sure UC Davis would like it if they could return, you know, return the favor there. Um, and I think it's possible because, again, you know, let's let's not kid ourselves. Uh, the, the the expenses of traveling one team to the other would be very little. It would be interesting because they're playing so late in the year. But yeah. you know, to that point, we played Eastern Washington in 2018 in November, and we were sent back up there for a quarterfinal game in December. So, you know, I think anything's possible, and, and you're right. I, I mean, this could seriously not be the first time we see each other this year. Yeah, and they kind of generally they don't, they try to avoid a first and second round matchup with these teams. But mm -hmm. I know to 2019, the Hornets and I think it was Hornets and Montana, Montana State, maybe Weber were all seated three, four, five, six in some order. And if yeah. the Hornets had won their playoff game, they would have hosted Montana State. So I, I, I think there's yeah. you know if things go well and the selection show and all that, there, there's a chance that we could see these guys again. I agree so. And I think, you know, the committee too, you know, doesn't want to have four teams from the same uh, conference in the semifinals. So right. you'll, you'll see those quarterfinal matchups where, you know, teams from the same conference might play each other again. So there's just so much on the line, right? It's just getting really good. And, uh, you know, the great thing about everything else with it being the causeway, anything can happen, right? It's not just about the playoffs, but it's about just that rivalry and everything else that goes along with it. That's what, you know, is going to be so fun to have in front of a sellout crowd on Saturday. Yeah, and my, much like we said before, too, Scott, I don't know if you felt that way in 18. I mean, it's just euphoria. You're so into it. You're so excited. But you also wonder, is this a one-time thing? And obviously now it's proven that yeah. it's not. And I wondered the same thing. You know, 2019, Troy Taylor's first year. I mean, this is amazing, yeah. but I don't know. And then here they are again. So I think the best news is these programs are well coached. They're recruiting great. They should be good here for a while. And I agree with you. And I think I felt maybe a little bit different just because Dan Hawkins and Troy Taylor are two of the best coaches in all of the country, I would say at any level. And so when a school like UC Davis has Dan Hawkins and when a school like Sacramento State has Troy Taylor, I mean, I, I, I feel like these are programs that are going to stand the test of time and, and both teams will be good for a long time, or at least as long as those two coaches are head coaches mm -hmm. in these schools. Yeah. Well, I just know I'm excited for it. I always, mm -hmm. I always look forward to it. We've had too many uh, 
two and eights versus three and sevens. We deserve this eight yeah. and two versus eight and two. The region does. The programs do. The players do. Um, it's awesome, and it's going to be at uh, UC Davis this year. And it's just one o'clock. All the different ways to check it out. Uh, it. I'm. I'm just fired up for this game. I cannot wait. This is as big as it gets. And again, the fact that it's the last game of the year. It's a conference game got conference championships on the line it's got playoff implications you couldn't ask for anything more this year yeah and then the best part is no matter what happens saturday or sunday morning the tv shows on the selection show yeah. and then everybody will be going oh man the hornets got this team the aggies got you know it's just we're going to yeah. be scouting ahead to see who's playing who no question it'll be moving right on and getting ready for the next part of the season yeah it's awesome well scott i'm so glad we we made it to this part i if i had to bet back on your early thought i would have thought the warriors kings would have happened before Mm -hmm. this but hey maybe that'll happen this year too boy let's hope so we know the warriors are going to be there that's for sure i mean the way they're playing right now and you know the kings started off so great too and even though they might be going for a little bit of a difficult patch it's early in the year and i obviously think they're a playoff caliber team i agree i agree well scott thank you and uh we will see you on saturday can't wait for it jay bird we're gonna have a great call we'll have a great time well i hope you enjoyed that conversation and i think you could tell by scott's tone my tone how excited we both are and i hope the region is and like i said my secret wish is that this is not the final game between these two teams this year that means they're both advancing playing multiple playoff games and that's likely a uh round of eight game or a final four who knows i would love it love it love it love it if they could play again because i think that would be fantastic but there's one to go it's this saturday it's the causeway you got to get out there if you can if not hopefully you check out all the different ways to uh to partake in it whether you're a fan listening on the radio or watching it on uh, tv check it out it's the, as big of a causeway that i can ever remember and so excited for these coaches these players the alumni the fans it's going to be a lot of fun. So next week, we'll have another episode of the show, and we'll have the, the playoff path. Will the Hornets be playing in a week? Will they have a bye week? We don't know yet. It's all going to be dictated on the Causeway Classic and the selection committee. But we're back next week for another edition of the Sacramento State Hornet Football Stingers Up podcast. Thanks so much for watching or for listening, and we're back next week.